This is the last film I'll be putting out on the ongoing controversy over the vaccine claims and the Dark Horse podcast. And I want to be clear that whenever I have criticisms or questions about someone's actions, I do everything I can to put them to them face to face. And I've done everything I can to avoid this getting into an oppositional back and forth. And I've been asking for a dialogue with Brett and Heather for many weeks now. This should not have been, and still should not be, about personal drama, but about the really big topics of sense-making around some of the most important questions of our time. However, there are criticisms and questions from viewers about my investigation that I want to address, and also criticisms made on a recent Dark Horse podcast that I want to respond to. I am deeply frustrated with David. And there's also other context that needs to be added. But this will be the final film specifically about the Dark Horse. I don't want to feed the outrage machine, and I still have a lot of respect for Brett and Heather. So throughout this, I've tried to distinguish between two things. The hardcore anti-vaccine advocates and the people who have genuine concerns, new concerns about these particular vaccines because they were produced so quickly in the middle of a pandemic. And so far, a lot of what I've been reporting has been generated by my conversations with many different medical figures. Some have been happy to be named publicly, others haven't been so keen, mainly because the hardcore anti-vaccine activists can be really nasty and obsessive. But some are happy to go on the record. And at the same time as I'm releasing this film, I'm bringing out a really important interview with a doctor called Eric Osgood. Eric was part of the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance alongside Pierre Corey, the main ivermectin advocate, and he's speaking out for the first time about what he's seen behind the scenes and his concerns about the direction that this has all taken. And what do you hope happens now? Um, I hope we hear more from the individual doctors in the group come out and say what I know that they believe, that, that they told me when I've spoken to them, which is that they understand that this is uh, the, the ongoing harm that is taking place. After these two films, Rebel Wisdom is going back to look at the bigger picture of sense-making. Over the next two weeks, we're launching a new series called The State of Sense-Making, with a whole series of deep dives into the problems that this story has shown up. This film you're about to see was recorded mainly as a dialogue and Q&A with Rebel Wisdom members in our digital campfire, with a few additions added later. Welcome everyone to a special Wednesday edition live call on the topic of the recent Dark Horse investigation, the investigation into vaccines, Dark Horse podcast, and all of those really important topics. If this is your first time on the call, this is gonna be a slightly different structure I'm recording this to go out on the channel and the and I'm going to be responding to the any of the criticisms that have been made any of the questions that have been raised sort of in the comments and the Q&A form that we put underneath the film that we released recently. One of the things that I'm very conscious of as well is um, the dynamics of this conversation and like part of it is sense making and is, is also kind of the dynamics in communities like this and I want to kind of be clear and sure that people feel able to express their criticisms. I know that some people feel more comfortable on a call like this, some people find feel more comfortable on text. So what for this call in particular we've done is the Q&A form that we ask people to put submit their questions on. You have the, I'm putting it in the chat now, you have the option to to put any question there anonymously, so you don't have to put your you don't have to put your name. If you want to initial a question there, you can do it with your initials. Sorry, with XX rather than your initials. The first couple of framing thoughts before I just uh, hand over quickly to Ali is, I would much prefer to be doing this in a dialogue with Brett and Heather. I've been asking for that for some weeks now, and I. I, I don't have never wanted it and did not want it to be in this kind of back and forth, which feels oppositional, just the def, just by, by its nature, it feels oppositional. And that's something I've tried to really avoid all the way through. But they have not wanted that for whatever reason. Um, I'm intending for this to be the last addressing of the topic. I'm going to put it out on the channel as the, the final pe the final word, um, certainly my final word. I'm not going to continue to comment on on Twitter. Um, 
but in this <clears throat> in this call, I'm going to address what Brett and Heather said in their last Q and A, and then any quest any commonalities in the questions that have come up, criticisms, and then any, any questions from this call. And we'll also have after I do my little sort of presentation um, update, which I imagine might last sort of half an hour, forty five minutes. We'll then have an opportunity for breakouts to talk about whatever's come up, and then we'll come back for more of a Q and A uh, after that. I hope that makes sense. Ali, did you have any thoughts? Yeah, I just want to say hi, hi to everyone, and welcome. Um, yeah, it's it's an interesting one for me. This topic, I've been fairly, re yeah, somewhat removed from it over the last few weeks as I've been working on on other projects. But obviously, something we talk about regularly, and and something that I think encapsulates like a lot of the most important questions we were kind of covering on the channel, but also we've been covering in the campfire, like how, the, the one of which being, how do we arrive at truth together? You know, that seems to me to be a really um, burning question right now. And something that's really been a, a huge theme in this and the different layers of that thing, um, quite interesting to go into, but it, you know, it just strikes me in that, you know, we're doing this as a, a call with everyone like that there is something quite profound and important about this question right now how we actually arrive at truth together and just how incredibly difficult it is in this time and place uh to be alive and trying to make sense of what's going on but possibly harder than it's ever been uh for any of our ancestors so yeah that's kind of what i've been some of the thoughts i've been having over the last uh couple of weeks yeah and just going into it i've i've, I've made a few notes that i'll probably look down at quite a bit the, one of the reasons I didn't want to do this, so the last film that I put out, the, the, the Dark Horse investigation, was done with an auto cue into camera. And I feel that's a little bit, I don't like that structure much. It feels a little bit disingenuous and um, I much prefer it as a, as a dialogue, which we'll get to in a bit. But even, even this feels more of a dialogue because I'm addressing you and there's kind of, I can see your body language. I can kind of react to that and that feels a lot more authentic than than reading from an auto cue which i think is something yeah this is one of the reasons for doing it in this in this way um, and one of the central questions are like what are what are our obligations in the, in the alternative media space how on earth do you do sense making outside the institutions and as i said i've i've, I've wanted to do this as a dialogue with brett and heather for, for quite a while i think a, a good couple of weeks at least and I've tried to be as ethical as I can all the way through, um, because partly because so much of the, all of these topics, but this topic in particular, everyone is so quick to assume bad faith, to accuse us of, others of bad faith. You've got this phenomenon of critics who use criticism as a kind of weapon for abuse. So as a kind of lost leader for a kind of abuse and a kind of real nastiness that I think you may be familiar with that, that happens quite a lot. And on the flip side, you've got people accusing bad faith as a way of avoiding engaging with critics. And I think both of those things are happening a lot. So I'm very conscious of that, sort of trying to avoid any impression of bad faith as well as, as, well as staying true to my ethical standards as much as I can. Um, which is why, for example, I sent all of the pieces, the written pieces to Brett and Heather well before they were published to get their responses to. There's been a lot of contact behind the scenes, multiple calls. Um, and one of the real difficulties is balancing this sort of public and private thing that has been, this is a completely new issue. Like we've never had to deal with this before. And that's been incredibly difficult. Like what am I able to say has been said publicly versus privately? What are my obligations to, to calls that are clearly off the record? Um, and I've tried to be balancing that as well, and that's incredibly difficult. Um, Brett has said a couple of things in their last Q&A that I think, that basically address some of the things that have been said privately, so I will address those in this call. Um, and yeah, I think this, this is gonna be quite, um, yeah, it's been a very, very intense process for me over the last three weeks, like incredibly intense, especially some of the interactions on, on Twitter. And I think what I've realized is that none of us are really equipped for this sort of super saturation of feedback that we get, especially when it's hostile. Like I really identify that, and I think that's a big part of where my sense is, that's a big part of where Brett and Heather are now. Like 
inundated with feedback, inundated with criticism, inundated with stuff that actually starts, we're, we're not equipped to deal with it. We're, we, we grew, we're kind of, our biology is equipped for dealing with tribes. We can't deal with like this intense level of information on any level, but also the level of criticism is really intense. Um, so yeah, like I said, the, the question sheet is in the, is in the chat. If you want to add to that, please do as we're going along, we'll get to that towards the end of the call. So generally, I'd say people are pretty locked into place on this topic by now, like generally, like the vac on the question of the vaccines. Um, there's a huge amount of intensity, a huge amount of intensity in people's personal lives. So I, we had this, um, we had a call a few weeks ago where we, we talked about vaccines and we, we had some people who were vaccinated, some people who were not vaccinated. And I really appreciated that everyone was able to have that conversation hear each other's perspectives and there wasn't any judgment or shaming. And there was actually really touching points. I remember one woman expressing that she felt almost like a leper in her environment because she was unvaccinated, her children were unvaccinated and feeling this sense of, um, yeah, there's a, there's a real sense of scapegoat energy around at the moment in lots of different areas. And this topic brings it up more than any, I think, where people are very quick to judge and very quick to G the, Girard talks about the scapegoat a lot, this kind of idea of that a function of society is this sort of scapegoat that takes the sins on themselves and that we, we've got this tendency to kind of find someone to do that to and it kind of unites us. It's a, it's a kind of very interesting theory that we'd like to actually get someone on to talk about it. Um, and for me, it's not about whether you're pro-vaccine or vaccine skeptical, it's about the quality of the evidence and the quality of the sense making. Um, and that's what I've tried to, to kind of bring it down to while also feeling this obvious sense of real ethical obligation that these are topics that are now really in my world. They turned up on my doorstep when Brett interviewed these people. I, I first expressed my concern to him when he had Geert van den Bosch on. This was long before any of the other kind of people. And I, and my concern was that he didn't, he didn't challenge him in any way. And Geert van den Bosch had already been on a lots of vaccine skeptical podcasts. It's not hard to go online and find criticisms of his position. And my point was, okay, Brett, what you're doing is upregulating someone who's already got a profile. He's been on Dell Big Tree. He's been on lots of these anti-vaccine shows. The least I think you could do is put some of the criticisms to him so he can respond. It's not hard to find those rather than just allow him to, to speak and to basically agree with everything he said. Um, and also Git van den Bosch has got, he, he's got his own interest in rival vaccines. Like that for me is an important piece of information you should be sharing with your audience if you're gonna feature people like this. And I've tried to do the same thing with the, the concerns about some of the other people that Brett has had on and some of their potential conflicts of interest or some of their backstory that means we should at least weigh it. It's not to say that they should be censored or they shouldn't make, be making the claims, but at least we should weigh up what they're saying in context with a lot of these other factors and we should be helping the audience make up their minds with as much of the information as possible and my sense from the beginning is that this hasn't been happening brett has been very heavily invested in one side of the narrative which is kind of rebels speaking up against the mainstream and uh, anti-consensus and contrarian and like that's a really powerful narrative that's a really really powerful narrative but it's only part of the story and the censorship is a big part, is a powerful narrative. And all of these things are really powerful, but they're not the whole story. So can we tell the whole story? Can we tell the story about, yes, there are corrupting factors of the mainstream. Yes, there are issues that we need to be worried about with um, the, the, the way that the debate is being framed, the way that these hugely powerful interests are involved in the conversation, all of these really important topics that Brett is bringing up, but also recognize that there is another part of the story as well. Can we hold that? not only the antithesis, not only the consensus, not only the antithesis, but also the synthesis. And how do we begin to do that? How do we begin to create sense-making processes that, that go for synthesis? And that's really what I want to con concentrate on after this is, after this is resolved, because that's the, the central problem we'll have to deal with long after this is, this is over. Um, I also want to say that it's not about the interpersonal drama either. A lot of people focus on that. It's about these crucially important topics. Um, I still have a huge amount of respect for Brett and Heather. 
Uh, and it's not about whether you like or dislike particular figures, whether you, you trust me or you trust Brett and Heather. Like, I don't think that's relevant. It's like, what's the quality of, because otherwise you're just proxying your sense making again. You're just proxying your sense making to different people. So this is really about following the arguments, following the evidence and making up your own minds. That's really what we've tried to be about since the beginning. Um, so yeah, I, that was one of the comments just before I bring Ali in. What, one of the comments was, well, you're a journalist and Brett and Heather are scientists. It's like, yes, I, I am a journalist. I'm not, I'm not trained as a scientist to evaluate claims, but I am trained to evaluate claims in a very different way. And I've been speaking to the best people that I can find who are scientists, who are medical figures, who are reliable sources of, of information. And I've been speaking to them and trying to weigh what they've said. And Brett and Heather are evolutionary biologists. That's their area of expertise. And they're clearly well outside that area of expertise. They've, they're obviously very, very smart people. I wouldn't argue with that. But I do think they've got caught in a very small bubble of information. And I think what I'm going to go, what I'm going to go through in a minute is going to hopefully demonstrate that. Um, yeah, Ali, did you want to? Yeah, so I thought we thought it would be useful to, um, before going into the the nitty gritty, which is um, complex, we thought it'd be useful to kind of zoom out a little bit and just place <clears throat> some of what, you know, I wanted to place some of what I've been observing in this, in, in the context of some of the ideas we've covered on the channel really from the beginning. And I think the, the first thing that comes up for me in this, and not just in terms of dark horse, but in terms of the, the wider conversation um, around vaccines and everything that's going on is that we can't really talk about complex ideas together without integrating what we know about how we think in the first place. And a big part of that, and something I've been researching, um, especially recently, is just the nature of cognition and the kind of fallacy that we think in rational terms, which is a kind of hangover from the Enlightenment, but it's also kind of a popular idea. You know, it's kind of we're going to have a reason debate. Even even the idea of a debate is is kind of a sense of you know you don't do ad hominem you. You don't talk about the person. It's just we're speaking at the level of ideas. And, you know, of course, there is value to that. But we know from huge amounts of research that our cognition isn't really that rational. In fact, we make decisions emotionally first and then post-rationalize them. And that's that uh, we're checking out the work of Antonio Damasio is famously one of the first people to look at that. And so, you know, this is something we've been talking about for quite a while. And way back, like, I guess, three years ago, when the intellectual dark web was kind of at its heyday, we started talking about the need for an intellectual deep web. So, and by that, uh, what we meant is a way of making sense of these complex ideas that doesn't just aim for the rational, but starts to integrate an understanding about how we make, how we kind of come to new ideas, how we process information and integrating inner and interpersonal development. Because without that, we're not, we're, we're making sense with a, what, what John Verveke would call a kind of a cracked frame. Without the ability to zoom out and look at our frame, we're stuck in reality tunnels. And I, I personally see that happening everywhere uh, all the time. And, and we all do it. Like we all fall into these reality tunnels. Why is it so difficult for us to change our minds? And I've recently come across something called the backfire effect, which I think is worth checking out. Um, and this is basically the phenomena of when we try and convince each other of uh, that the ideas we're holding are wrong, it often has the effect of it further entrenching our belief in that idea. And the neuroscience around it suggests that the closer that idea is linked to your identity, so if it's a political idea or if it's a religious idea, the more intense the effect. Um, and this this all came out maybe 10, 10 years ago, people started talking about this, but I think it's really worth it's it's something we're worth knowing about ourselves and it can be changed like it's it, it, it's argued quite how much but it does shift with enough contrary info um so good information in the information ecology is incredibly important because it does help us change our minds um and then the last the last piece is the um that i've really been thinking of a lot is that all of this is happening within the context of an incredibly intense time in our culture. Um, and a lot of unconscious, uh, 
drives and forces are moving through culture and moving through each of us. And so there are valid concerns over like authoritarianism. Um, and there's also a valid breakdown of trust in institutions. There's a reason we don't trust our institutions. But at the same time, the complexity is that um, as, as Joseph Henrik talked about in a film we put out uh, right before um, all of this, actually about three weeks ago, um, it, weird people, Western educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic, we developed a particular cultural psychology whereby institutional trust is actually built in to our psychology. So our sense of safety in the world, our sense of coherence is built into institutions because we don't have kin networks that we can trust. So that adds a whole other factor, I think, and to the complexity and the intensity of, of the current information landscape. And it's, yeah, it's it's a tricky one. This is something I've been thinking about a lot, um, is that the tension between leaving the old institutional frameworks, building new ones, and the Wild West, and we, we've talked about this, David's called it the uncanny valley um, of sense making. It's like we are in this, this Wild West of figuring out what's going on. Um, and that requires us to, I think, recognize that first, but also like, as we talk about a lot to skill up in some way and, and to stay curious and to, to even more than we normally would resist the urge to fall into intense certainty. Really good point. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm going to start off by playing a clip from Brett and Heather's most recent Q&A. And again, just to say, this is the la I hope this is the last time that I have to, to address this. Um, and I believe like an important distinction here is, um, in the vaccine claims at least, is the distinction Daniel Schmachtenberger made between speaking truth and speaking truthfully. I believe Brett and Heather are speaking the truth as, as best they, they can, uh, as best they are aware. And I've been clear all the way through and try to be as careful and um, clear as I can that I do not believe that there is any element of bad faith. I believe that they are careful people really trying to do their best. Um, but I don't, I don't believe on, on some of the most important topics they are speaking truth, the correspondence with reality. Um, so before we do that, okay, I'm going I'm to play the, the clip from Heather talking about the, the article. Have you read or seen David Fuller's latest pieces about his concerns about you being in a confirmation bubble about COVID-19? Much love from a concerned listener. Um, yeah. That all? What more is there to say? I mean, there... there there is a lot more to say, but basically, um, there's been very little careful scientific pushback. Uh, there's been a lot of social push pushback. And what we have said privately to people is this feels very postmodern. It feels very familiar. It feels very much like there's a social universe um, and a set of social conclusions that people insist that we must come to. And um, trying to figure out what is actually true um, should not interface with that social universe, nor does social pressure change what is actually true. And so we have made a conscious decision to not be talking about it as much anymore absent big changes in what we understand to be true. We are not going to play defense. We are not going to respond to uh, critiques that don't have new information in them and the people making them know what uh, what that means. And um, there's just a lot of evidence that continues to grow that suggests that the position that we have laid out, both in what we wrote and what we have said on many previous episodes, um, holds. And if that changes, if anything about that reverses, we will absolutely come to, um, to, to you, our listeners. I know that Heather thought that the Aereo article was postmodern because she told me. Um, and as I said to her then, the reason for that is that I took out all of the evidence from that article because it felt like a really awkward fit. So the Aereo article was published at the same time as this Medium article, which is about 25 pages long and contains all of the evidence. The, uh, the, the piece that was put out on the channel 
was also only contained sort of fractions of the evidence. It was, it was kind of, you can't really do that in a podcast. So we spent weeks pulling together as many claims and counterclaims as we could and put them into that medium document for as much evidence as possible. Um, and the, the medium article starts with their Substack piece that they put out and takes, uh, criticizes that. Um, the interesting thing is like thinking about this as well, I, I kind of wonder why so many of these conversations end up becoming personal. And I think it's because as a public intellectual and probably as an academic as well, like academic discussions are notorious for getting personal very, very quickly. Um, in universities and stuff, like they're, no, they're notorious. And I think it's because it's very difficult, like you try to separate the person and their ideas, but it's very hard to do that because you're also implicitly criticizing someone's ability to weigh data or someone's, um, a, someone's desire to kind of question their, you're, you're questioning their ability to understand ideas or their, like it's very difficult to talk about these in a way without people taking it as being personal people taking it as being ad hominem or attacking people rather than the ideas. Um, the issue that I've got with, with the claims that, that they've been making in the, that Substack article and then in particular in some of the podcasts as well is I don't think, I think far too many of them could not be made by anyone who was in dialogue with anyone with medical training or even with a certain degree of common sense about kind of what's been going on thus far in the pandemic. Even myself, who's kind of been tracking it as a journalist and kind of building up a picture, some of the stuff that they're saying I just don't think fits into that picture in any way. And I'll give a few examples now. Um, so just to rattle through some of the, I, I, I'd recommend anyone watching to, to read the Medium article because that's really where most of the data is and it's been sort of the most carefully put together. But in their Substack article, for example, they talk about four clear signals and ivermectin as a prophylactic none of which really stand up. Um, they still only mention the Tess Lorry study as, the, as their kind of conclusion that ivermectin is still highly effective. Tess Lorry is an advocate for ivermectin. She's allowed to be an advocate. She's, I think she's a, a deeply caring woman who is trying to really help, help the world. But I don't think, I think you should be then a little bit more skeptical of whether she's the right person to be assessing the truth claims. You've got people like Andrew Hill who also was in favor of ivermectin and then when some of the studies were, were withdrawn, he said, okay, we need more data, let's, let's be cautious now. And so most of the certainty now is being driven by people like Tess Laurie and Pierre Corey, who have staked a huge amount of personal investment and personal credibility on this being the case. Um, some of the qu claims that they make, I think, just don't pass any kind of common sense test, like claiming that data from India shows that ivermectin worked as a prophylactic. Um, one, it was never used there as a prophylactic to stop you getting COVID, never widely. The data now shows that deaths in India were hugely undercounted by about a factor of 10. Two of the places where they looked at and said, these are the success stories for ivermectin have since turned out to have the second and fourth highest death ratio in India. And also just generally speaking, if you know anything about India and just kind of engage your, your thought process for a minute, it's like of, of all places where India, one of the most overpopulated places in the world where most people don't have any access to healthcare whatsoever. Does it really make sense that India was able to roll out an effective prophylactic ivermectin campaign where people would need doses once a week in huge, huge numbers? Like that, that just doesn't really make much sense as even, yeah, it just doesn't make much sense as an argument for me. Um, there was a claim that ivermectin is something like 100% effective at preventing COVID based on one Carvalho study from Argentina, which is seriously flawed. Some people think that it didn't actually happen at all. Um, I think the worst for me, and which is why I put it in the film and, and why I'm returning to it now, is the fertility claims that were made on the podcast by Steve Kirsch and repeated by Brett, where Brett said, these vaccines are not safe for women at all. The cognitive dissonance between what the CDC says is that this is safe for pregnant women. Right. This is perfectly safe. And it's on the CDC website. It's unbelievable. It's at some level, it's not safe for women at all. The evidence that that was based on in that podcast was, was untrue, was false, demonstrably false. And that has serious consequences for people that are watching it. If there, are, if there is more evidence, 
if there are steel man versions of some of the claims that were made on these podcasts, I would, I would like to hear them. I, I think they're really important topics. So another thing I'd say is why, why are Brett and Heather saying that they're no longer going to cover this topic? They've, they've created a platform on Odyssey where they can talk about whatever they want. They don't have to rely on, they don't have to worry about being demonetized by YouTube as long as they don't put that content on YouTube. So I think they're free to continue to follow this if they want to. Um, they also claimed that the vaccines hadn't been trialed on animals. We did not know that it had skipped the animal trials that might have alerted us to something really dangerous. Um, yeah, they didn't, even, they didn't even test I, the vaccine I did, itself in the I animal trials. I didn't know. Which is ludicrous. Like they were trialed or whatever you think about the vaccine safety, they were, tri they were animal trials. There were animal trials on mice, there were trials on monkeys, there were human trials. And that, that one claim, which was made on the podcast with Steve Kirsch, and then also Tess Laurie said it to me as well, shows for me like how small the echo chamber is of the kind of vaccine skeptical community, who are all in contact with each other, who are all in this sort of very small bubble, to be able to, to, to for it to be an article of faith that the vaccine didn't go through animal trials, is like that shows you're not really speaking to anyone outside that bubble who's challenging your thinking, because it's one of the most easily disproven things about the vaccines. Another criticism people made is that I used a clip about Leslie Lawrenson in the film, who died of COVID after refusing the vaccine and had also shared Brett's content. Firstly, Brett himself referenced Lawrenson on Twitter. Secondly, I made sure to include Brett's perspective that it was clear Lawrenson didn't follow the dark horse too closely, as they have been clear since the beginning of the pandemic that COVID was really dangerous, which Lawrenson didn't believe. And the reason to use it is that this is clearly relevant. Brett and Heather have become arguably the most high profile vaccine skeptics in the world when they started boosting these claims and hosting these figures. And the death of Lawrenson illustrates the stakes involved. And his death was a major news story across the world. If you don't like that, then sorry, but it's an editorial judgment that I stand by. And, and the one that I did single out in the film, and I think I'm coming back to because I think it's the, the most peculiar argument for evolutionary biologists to be making, is the argument about the, the vaccine trials creating the variants. So it was an argument that, that Geert van den Bosch said that the vaccines could create variants. And I had a long back and forth with Brett about this, where he told me, no, no, van den Bosch has been proved right. And I said, what do you mean has been proved right? That all of the... The argument is that the vaccines are not a perfect, um, because they are leaky vaccines, then you can have variants that will escape the vaccines. So that was Geert van den Bosch's argument. He said, we should stop vaccinating in the middle of a pandemic because we might create variants that will escape the vaccines and it's dangerous. Um, so if you think about what that means, it's, it's kind of a numbers game. The more, the more people who are infected, the more people who are vaccinated, the more chances for a mutation that will overcome the vaccination and then will spread among vaccinated people. It's a, it's a pure numbers game. And so I had this back and forth with Brett and Brett said, he's been proved right, just look at all the variants. And I said, Brett, what are you talking about? These variants emerged before there was any vaccine penetration. Like the alpha variant came from Kent in the UK before the vaccines existed. Um, the Delta variant came from India where there's no vaccine penetration. Like what, I, I don't understand what you mean. And so I'd had this back and forth and then in their Substack article, they addressed that with a claim that was, the vaccines emerged, sorry, the variants emerged because of vaccine trials in the countries where they emerged. In India, there was a vaccine trial. In Brazil, there was a vaccine trial. In the UK, there was a vaccine trial. And I said, hang, hang on, Brett. Like, the whole point is that Geert van der Bosch's argument is a numbers game. It's like the more people, the more vaccinations. If it's this easy, like if a small vaccine trial can create variants, now that we have such penetration by the vaccines, we would be seeing variants happening on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. It would be, we'd be overrun with variants if it was that easy to create them. Like that, that for me is such a peculiar argument to make as an evolutionary biologist or two evolutionary biologists that it really looks like they were trying to kind of reinforce their point about Geert van der Bosch being correct and look for the first argument they could find. I don't know where from, but, but it just doesn't add up. It's, it's like, the odds of that being the case, that the variants actually came from these vaccine trials is very, 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 maybe, maybe proved true. If it's true, that is incredibly big news. That is front page news every bit, everywhere. 
every newspaper in the world would print that. Like the Delta variant that's ravaging the world, that's keeping us all in lockdown, was caused by vaccine trials. That's, that's huge. That would be of interest to everyone. And, and this, which is why I don't think it's the case, and also the, the, the odds are incredibly low that it happened because of vaccine trials. Also, how many vaccine trials were in how many different countries at what, what, at what time? Is it simply the case that these four countries had vaccine trials and everywhere else didn't? I think that's highly unlikely. That's another huge, huge story that I don't believe in a conspiracy big enough to stop that getting out. Like these kind of stories are being picked up by health journalists all the time. Like the breakthrough cases around Delta are being picked up. This is not, this is the problem with conspiratorial thinking is some, some conspiracies can be true, but once it gets to a certain point, it's like, and that's why I think when you go down that route of paranoia, you start losing your ground because if that's true, if that's true, then they must be in on it and they must be in on it and suddenly you've lost your ground and you're in, you're in a place where you can't trust anything and you're looking for any excuse to um, reject anything that doesn't fit with your pre-existing biases. Like if anyone can be in on it, then no piece of data is safe, nothing is safe, no journalist is safe, no health authority is safe. It kind of gets to the point where you just, you, you start feeling your kind of legs go from under you. Um, so I'm gonna play another clip that Brett put forward, and then I'm gonna to respond to that, and then we're gonna go into, into a breakout. Yeah, I guess one last point I would make, as long as we're going to talk about this. I am deeply frustrated with David. Um, David amplified the Better Skeptics Project. He came to me privately and talked it up. He apparently suggested one of the referees for the project, so he had an important role in how it unfolded. And then at the point that it went through our stuff meticulously, something like 44 claims that we had misrepresented, they found three in which there was some indication. Um, one of them we should probably come back to at least. But nonetheless, the point is he amplified the process. Right? I thought this is a dangerous way to do this. It's prone to several different kinds of bias that I don't see um, protected against in it. And I was very concerned uh, about, you know, a process that, um, you know, incentivize instead of people having skin in the game, it incentivized them to go nitpicking and, yeah. um, and all of this. But anyway, in the end, it gave us not a totally clean bill of health, but a remarkably clean bill of health in light of how much um, landscape and how many complaints uh, certain people had made. So given that that process concluded and that that process does say something about the quality of what we've been doing here on Dark Horse, didn't David have some obligation to say, well, you know, here's the process that I suggested might evaluate this and here's the conclusion, which is not what he did. He actually circumvented it. And yeah. um, frankly, I resent it, which David knows because I've said it to him. Yeah. As Brett said at the end, We've had this conversation. We had a very heated back and forth uh, last Monday, I think it was, on privately, and he's now obviously made that public. Um, he's talking about the Better Skeptics project, which we featured on Rebel Wisdom um, as a novel sense-making project. It was about checking the claims in specific podcasts that they put out. They put together uh, transcripts. They asked people to submit. Um, criticisms and they had three independent referees to go through it. Um, firstly, for the first thing I say is that the, the Medium article I put together in particular was mainly focused on their Substack article, which came out after the Better Skeptics. I don't know if it came out after it concluded, but it certainly wasn't part of the, it wasn't related to the, the three podcasts that were being looked at, the four podcasts that were being looked at. It was mainly, and that Substack article came after the films with was after the film with Yuri, and after the Quillette article. It was their response to those films with Yuri in the Quillette article. Um, secondly, the Better Skeptics project was an interesting and valiant prototype, but even the referees will tell you that it didn't get at the truth claims anywhere near the truth claims on the podcast. It wasn't set up for that. It was set up as a strict sort of falsifier, falsifiability criteria, but it's a long way, it, it's been a long way from those three claims that were supposedly validated. Um, my, inter, my interest in the project, I, I've been looking at I, and concerned about Brett and Heather's content well before the Better Skeptics project came along. I was approached by them 
I don't quite know why. I was involved with them at the beginning, talking, and then they gave me this kind of um, observer role, which literally just meant observing the Twitter thread where they were having their conversations. Um, I never signed up to be bound by it in any way. The, what Brett is talking about, like I did talk to Brett about it because, and I actually had a call with Brett, not about that, it was about something else, and he raised his concerns about the Better Skeptics project, and I said, he, he was concerned that it would be a hit piece on him, he was concerned that it might be kind of used by um, people to launder claims against him, and I said, I don't think that's what's gonna happen, I don't think that's what the intention of it is, I don't think this guy Alexandros is out, out to destroy you, so I, I did kind of reassure him, look, look, I don't think this project is, 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 is designed to kind of take you down. Um, and I still maintain that. Like, I don't, think, I don't think it was. I think it was a real attempt to kind of create some new kind of decentralized sense-making system. But there's no way that I agreed to say, oh, and by the way, I'm just going to ignore all my other complaints or all my other concerns about your podcast and wait for the better skeptics to, to, to judge. Um, he... He was also believes, and I think Alex, who, who, who kind of led the Better Skeptics Project, is upset because they believe I subverted it by interviewing Yuri. So Yuri Dagan had made a lot of the submissions to the Better Skeptics Project, had been criticizing it a lot publicly, and I'd actually tried to kind of get him to lay off, both publicly and privately, just Yuri, just give it a fucking rest. Let them, let them do what they do and stop criticizing it because I thought it wouldn't have a chance of succeeding if it was just under constant attack. And I also thought it wouldn't have a chance of succeeding if it wasn't getting submissions from people outside Brett's bubble. And Alex, who created it, is a super fan of Brett and Heather's. Like, he's a massive super fan of Brett and Heather's. And I knew that that would be a problem for people trusting it to make submissions, which I talked to him about at the beginning. So, yeah, Brett and Alex believe that my interviewing of Yuri before it was completed was an attempt to subvert the process, which is just is not true. Like, the, the reason I interviewed Yuri... So, Yuri came on, he did his presentation. The reason I interviewed Yuri is because Brett and Heather referred to Yuri two or three times, referred to the Quillette article, and pretty much dismissed him to their audience. Dagan's other favorite argument here has to do... Still with regard to this uh, Argentina yes, paper. Yes, with, with, with regard to the, uh, the Argentina paper, is that it can't possibly have had this effect. And the way Yuri Dagan knows that it can't possibly have had this effect is that the decay rate in the blood of ivermectin is such that the number is way below the threshold of Yuri Dagan's belief um, for effectiveness, right? And so because it falls below the Dagan threshold, Yuri thinks that it can't have had this <laughs> effect on their physiology, right? Um, but no, I mean, this is an yeah. incredible argument because for one thing, it rather assumes that Yuri Dagan knows how it does or doesn't work. That graph is very scientific looking. I will grant mm, it's Yuri Dagan numbers. it's a very scientific looking graph and it's a very scientific sounding argument. And in any mm. case. Yeah, I mean, it does use some words that sound sciencey. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Like Half-Life, mm. right, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, enough <laughs> razzing Yuri Dagan for his preposterous argument. Um, They're getting, what, 100,000 viewers each time they were pretty much kind of saying, Yuri's, Yuri has no signal, everything Yuri says doesn't make sense. And I thought, I don't think that's fair. And I also don't think that's fair to the ecosystem and to the sense-making commons. My, my real, and if you watch the piece with Yuri, I don't think you can watch that and come to the conclusion that he has no good points. I don't think, I don't think that's possible. There's, there's clearly some signal there, even though he's a, a bit of a dick. Um, and I think w w Yuri wouldn't mind me saying that about him. I was doing this for the health of the information commons. I thought, okay, it's not fair that people are, people are clearly exposed to all of the counterpoints. They're not exposed to the, the arguments. So that was the reason I interviewed Yuri. And if you watch that interview with Yuri, I am proud of that interview. I challenged him on many points. I put Brett and Heather's counterpoints to him to get him to respond to it. I, I did that in as ethical way as I could. I didn't just get him on and agree the hell out of him which is what Brett's done with all of his guests. I tried to treat it in an ethical way, and I tried to put all of the counterpoints that I was aware of to Yuri at the time. I think there had been criticisms of the Quillette article and the way that you expressed yourself that I agree with. I contacted you soon after that article came out, and maybe we'll start here. I contacted you soon after that article came out, 
And I said that whatever you were trying to do, whoever you were trying to reach, I thought that was a real tactical error by you and Claire Belinsky to have such loaded language in the Quillette piece. You used phrases like, um, talking of Brett, his promotion of outright quackery during a pandemic that has killed more Americans than any catastrophe since the Civil War is immoral. And I thought that was a very short-sighted thing to do because that kind of language, framing it in terms of shaming and morality and those kind of topics, and that kind of language I thought would be likely to turn off anyone that you might reach because for, for a good reason, I think people are well aware and suspicious of anything that looks like bad faith or anything looks like loaded language or emotional language. Um, so the bad faith, man. Like, <laughs> so yeah. What? How do you respond? How do you respond to that, Yuri? First of all, I think people don't understand what bad bad faith means when they use this term. Because, I mean, legally, bad faith implies that you have some ulterior motive of doing something and you're actually faking whatever you're, the reason you're saying you're doing has, like, if I was doing this, calling Brad out or using whatever the language to, I don't know, get views or fame or, I don't know, being paid by Pfizer to do this, that would be bad, bad faith. I'm not. I don't care about views. I don't care about followers. I don't have a Patreon. And I stand by that piece. I think it was the right thing to do. It got a, a mixed reaction. Obviously, people, some people liked it. Some people thought he had good points. Some people didn't. Like that's, that's sense making. That's people making up their minds. That's being exposed to the whole story and making up your mind for yourself. It leads to a really big question though. Why did the case for ivermectin get caught up and entwined with the much more dodgy anti-vaccine arguments? And why are there such close overlaps between them? So things have been moving pretty fast since we did our piece on ivermectin called For and Against a few weeks ago. I said in the last piece, whether or not ivermectin works well, the narratives were on one side that it was proved to work, the evidence was overwhelming, and the only answer why it wasn't being used was that it was being deliberately suppressed. There's a drug, it has positive effects. Why am I not seeing it discussed more? And then as I went deeper into the evidence and as you all generated more evidence and put it into the world and as the natural experiments that are in the world revealed themselves and showed the very same pattern, it became clear that this was actually taken in the aggregate. The amount of evidence is incredible, right? This is a very clear signal. It'd be hard to miss it unless that was your purpose, unless you had some confusion or reason not to want to know. On the other, it was that the data was quite low quality and lots of the argument didn't add up. And I said in the last piece that the former narrative is now clearly disproved. Even though ivermectin may still be proved to work, it's clear that the data was as bad, if not worse, than the skeptics said it was. Now, Gideon Meyerowitz Katz says that fully a third of the ivermectin research wasn't just shoddy or dodgy, but probably didn't happen at all, was clear fraud. The legacy media is starting to finally catch up with the ivermectin story. A recent reports that around 70% of the calls to the Mississippi Poison Control Center were related to ingestion of livestock or animal formulations of ivermectin purchased at livestock supply centers. And the case is clearly falling apart in real time. As I said earlier, in the last day or so, People who've been working with Pierre Corey at the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance have been distancing themselves from the anti-vaccine messaging coming from the organization. Eric Osgood, MD, said he was truly sorry for any role he played in the turn this took. And as I said, I'm releasing an interview with Eric at the same time as this, and you should really watch it if you're interested in hearing what's been going on behind the scenes. Yeah, it, it sounds like you're getting um, attacked from all sides by trying to hold a nuanced position in the center. Uh, which is um, kind of interesting. And yeah, I'm a pharma chill. I work for Bill Gates. I'm paid by pharma. And I'm going to be, uh, you know, I get a lot of references to Nuremberg and other things for because I'm convincing people to get the vaccine. I'm going to be put on trial for crimes against humanity. And then on the other side, you know, I'm a, I'm a snake oil salesman and a ivermectin huckster pusher pushing quackery and snake oil when it's, I mean, I don't, I think I'm either one of those things, but I guess people can say whatever they want. 
So I'd like to offer an apology to Pierre Corey. We asked him for an interview on a couple of occasions, although I reported in the last film and didn't hear anything back. Uh, since found out that we had an out-of-date email address, we are now in touch and he has been invited to appear whenever he'd like to respond. And something I'd really, really like to ask him is why a seemingly ethical and honourable guy like him has gotten caught up with someone like Steve Kirsch, a man who even the Dark Horse comments thread realised was a bit of a wrong one. Oh, you Same. don't think yeah. it's possible, right? right? So when a doctor sees a, a miscarriage and says, I've never seen a, a baby like this in my entire career where it's so bloody and the brain is split in half and so forth. So I'm going to say this really clearly. If you're pro-ivermectin or vaccine skeptical and you don't call out the obvious bullshit on your own side, then you are proving yourself to be untrustworthy. Kirsch has made many clearly false claims based on either accidental or deliberate misreading or misrepresentation of evidence and corrected very few of them. I will never host Steve Kirsch on Rebel Wisdom for this reason, but if you do want to hear him demolished in a debate, then check out the recording with Avi Bitterman. I'll link to it below. Why don't you use the control group? I'm not group? even talking about a control group. You're so lost. You're so lost right now. Look, oh, I'm, all I'm, I'm telling I'm you sorry, is I'm, that, I'm, yeah, you are so, you have been, you're so lost. I'm, Look, I'm, all I'm, I'm telling terrible. you right now, all I'm telling you, all yeah. I'm telling you, you're not following the words I'm saying. So the question it raises is, how often do people have to show that they say things that are not true, fail to correct them, fail to call out the bullshit on their own side to show that they're not trustworthy? All of these people in this email thread and that we featured are discredited by their association with Steve Kirsch. So something else that I talked about in the Medium article but didn't mention on the channel was talking about Robert Malone, because he comes across as everything that Steve Kirsch wasn't in that appearance on The Dark Horse. Sober, well-judged, with real gravitas, and is probably becoming the key figure in the vaccine skeptical camp. Um, I think it would be good, I'll link to this recent article that appeared in The Atlantic, which I think was very balanced, talked about in a positive way, included quotes from a former colleague who says that he could have been eligible for a Nobel Prize, but that he's screwing it up now. He's framed on Brett's podcast as something like a reluctant whistleblower as the inventor of mRNA technology. Firstly, it's really unclear if he is the inventor, the inventor of mRNA vaccines. It's pretty rare for one person to be considered the inventor of any scientific discovery. Most of the credit so far has been going to a woman called Catalina Carrico, although it's definitely true that Malone was involved in the process of vaccine development. So the way that he's framed on Brett's podcast, whistleblowers are a key part of journalism and one of the principal things to look out for as a journalist dealing with a whistleblower, a big red flag, is whether they had any major fallings out with their previous workplace. So whether they have an axe to grind other than just revealing the truth. And if you look at Malone's website, I think he's changed it now, but it originally talked about how incredibly angry he was at being written out of the history of these vaccines. He called it intellectual rape. And his wife said it left him with PTSD. So... Again, some people will say this is ad hominem, but I think this is part of sense making. I don't think he should be censored, and I think he should be in dialogue with people who disagree with him. But does that experience that happened to him affect what he's saying and what the evidence that he's putting forward and what he's looking for now? Humans are human, so I think we should weigh what he's saying with that knowledge in mind. Again, I'll link to the Atlantic article that's got a lot of good backstory below. So something I've tried to pull apart since the beginning is the anti-vaccine hardcore, and people who are just concerned about these novel vaccines and have quite well-founded concerns about vaccines that were created so quickly in the middle of a pandemic. But there's a huge overlap between the two. And I think what people maybe need to know and don't know, that maybe people who've acted as journalists and have been around this kind of topic for a while know, is that the anti-vaccine ecosystem was very well developed before the pandemic. And with social media and the pandemic, it was ready to spread and take over. So one good example, the main figurehead of the movement is a guy called Andrew Wakefield, who every British journalist is aware of because it created such a huge scandal and was a huge failure of the media. So Wakefield claimed in 1998 that he discovered a link between autism and the MMR jab in the UK. This was a paper published in Nature magazine one of the principal scientific journals, and got a huge amount of coverage in the media. 
Eventually, Wakefield was investigated, he was struck off. The way that this is framed by anti-vaccine activists is that he was the victim of an MSM smear campaign. This is completely untrue. In fact, it was the MSM, the mainstream media, that boosted his claims for months. And that was why it had such an impact on journalists. It took one investigative journalist, a guy called Brian Deere, to dedicate years of his life to researching and understanding what happened. And he found out that Wakesfield's study that was published in Nature, which was only of 12 children, wasn't what he had claimed. Wakefield's study was paid for by a lawyer acting for the families of the kids, trying to find proof that they could use to sue the vaccine manufacturers. Wakefield was paid nearly half a million pounds for his work. He'd also lied about the kids all happening to attend one London hospital. He'd flown some of them in from America. His study, and this isn't the end of it, there were incredible things that he did, like taking blood from kids at a birthday party. His study was fraudulent from beginning to end and fell apart under scrutiny. We actually pulled together a short briefing document on Wakefield that I'll also post below. The Lancet retracted the article and Wakefield was struck off and disqualified by the General Medical Council in the UK after the longest hearing in history. Wakefield was a classic old Etonian, eccentric Englishman, really arrogant and refused to ever consider that he could have been wrong. After he was discredited here in the UK, he left to go to America, where he became a superstar of the anti-vaccine circuit and produced films on vaccines that were promoted by the likes of Robert De Niro. And this is why the anti-vaccine movement discredits itself in the same way that many of these figures are discrediting themselves by not calling out the bullshit from people like Steve Kirsch. If you're not prepared to call out the bullshit on your own side and you're prepared to ally with people who are making clearly untrue claims, then that discredits you in a seriously major way. So now I come to the, the core point that I've been holding back from saying. I've, I've been trying to have these conversations with Brett for a long time. Yuri had been trying to have these conversations with Brett for a long time. He'd been in contact with Brett behind the scenes for a long, long time before the Quillette article came out, before the, the Rebel Wisdom film came out. Brett refused to dialogue with Yuri. He refused to dialogue with me. He said in that clip we just had, he thought the better skeptics wasn't the right way to have this conversation. He thought it was basing it on transcripts. Look, what, so what is the right way to have the conversation? Like who, he has had no one on, he has had no dialogues on his show with anyone who disagrees with him. And as far as I can tell, he's only dialoguing with vaccine skeptical people. And I've been talking to these doctors, these medical figures, some of whom are fans of Brett's content, some of whom say, I was a fan of the IDW, I was a fan of Brett, and I've been deeply, deeply concerned by what's going on. Some of them pleading with me to put them in touch with Brett behind the scenes. Yeah, given, given the level of stakes involved, I, fi I find that hard to understand. I really find that hard to understand. Um, and it leaves me at a, at a loss for words, if I'm honest. It leaves me incredibly frustrated, incredibly... Yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to say too much on this subject, but I feel extremely strongly about it. I feel very strongly about that because I just, I just don't think that's... I don't think that's okay. Let's put it that way. Um, so, yeah, I think I've concluded the piece that I wanted to express, and I think it would be good to decompress a little bit. Uh, I know a lot of this has been intense. Thank you for your attention and for staying with me through this. I think I said at the beginning, this has been one of the most intense experiences I've ever had. Certainly the most intense experience with Rebel Wisdom and possibly ever. Um, the last three weeks has been incredibly difficult. This balance of public and private and kind of how do we do this? How do we sense make? How do we balance our obligations to people as friends versus our obligations to the truth versus our kind of feelings of how do we avoid being dragged into oppositional frames ourselves and just wanting to attack people or just wanting to kind of and knowing that there are reward systems on both sides for all of that as well, like 
oh, will, will I get recognition for this? Or will I get recognition for that? Or will my audience turn on me for this? Or will my audience turn on me for that? And I, I think one of the other comments that's turned up quite a lot in the comments is, oh, you call this rebel wisdom. It's like, well, yes, actually. I think challenging your own audience and putting out stuff that you know is going to get you attacked. Yeah, I'll, I'll stand behind that. I'll stand behind... Um, and also people say, oh, well, why should we trust a BBC and Channel 4 journalist? It's like, well, I'm also a BBC and Channel 4 journalist who blew up my career with, with Channel 4 and the mainstream media when I released my film with Jordan, Pe with Jordan Peterson criticizing Channel 4, Glitch in the Matrix in early 2018, when I had nothing to go to. Like Rebel Wisdom didn't exist then. So, so yeah, I, people, trust, people trust for whatever reasons they will, but... All, all I can do is say what I think to the best of my ability and people will make their own judgments. But yeah, it's been an incredibly difficult process all the way through. Um, and it's, it's been great to have the dialogues that we've had over the last few weeks where there's been some really great suggestions and some great feedback and some great questions and it's really felt like a, a support through this. So let's create some breakout groups and we'll come back in about 15 minutes time, something like that. Gagelli, your question really resonates and I think it's um, a really good one if you wanted to ask it yourself or you wanted to, to get one of us to read it out. I hope I represent your uh, your viewpoint correctly in the question, but you're concerned with the fact that while Brett and Heather are putting out certain information, they're not presenting all the information, but the important that information that's most pertinent to them. So, for example, one example you raised is that they talk a lot more about how big pharma is broken, but not a lot about the ways in which it work in which it does work. Which is, for example, Yuri's background is mostly with in which it, it does work. And the problem you're wrestling with, as I understand it, is how does the media landscape develop good habits so that it presents all of the facets of a problem? And basically, because it seems like in your inquiry, you were wanting Brett to present also. So you were, uh, you would, it seemed like it would be ben, uh, favorable. I'll just read it. Does the problem rest on each podcaster individually or in some ways the podcasting landscape collectively? For example, is the Dark Horse podcast itself responsible for hosting all the character arguments to their own uh, arguments? Or is the larger structure of the podcast landscape, is that bearing the responsibility of presenting both Dark Horse arguments and counterpoint to that because at the end of the day each sense maker provides only an estimate of the estimator of the truth as far as it is inferable and then we still need to average over all the sense makers so might it be a project for somebody with your conviction a podcaster of your conviction to set up some waveguides between the echo chambers or is it up to each podcast to like reach its own tentacles out to the other podcasts to, to do this information exchange that you're struggling and lamenting the Lack yeah. Of. Yeah, it's a really good question. I think there's two questions there. Firstly, my my issue isn't centrally that Brett is only focused on one side of it. My my concern centrally is that I think he's putting out misinformation. I don't think he's correcting it. Like that's my central concern is like the life impact of the information that he's putting out and I I think a lot of it is is incorrect and I think it's dangerously incorrect that's that's my my sense and that's not to say that the vaccines are hugely safe and like I'm, I'm i'm open to the idea that there are other arguments or other people out there that are making more coherent arguments um the second point is the really interesting one and that, that's where i think we do need a collective solution and like some of the ideas are like could there be I had this conversation with with another podcaster the other day uh, and recorded it and hopefully should be putting it out soon with Chris Williamson, who does the Modern Wisdom podcast. 
And he he's interviewed quite a lot of the similar similar people. And we've had a lot of conversations behind the scenes about kind of like media ethics. And he's wrestling with that and like wrestling whether who do I get on my podcast? I'm not I'm not usually a, a critical interviewer. So how do I deal with that? Like the, I think that we do need some kind of solution, especially if we're going to be talking about heterodox ideas or dangerous ideas. I think we need some form of protocol or some form of network where we hold each other accountable, we challenge each other. That was that was the arc of the conversation that I had with Chris the other day was we started off with me sort of saying, I think we need some kind of, which goes back to the whole intellectual dark web. Like we've been saying this about the intellectual dark web for a long time. It's like they they tried to solve the problem by identifying a set of people with audiences and said, well, they'll have dialogues with each other about topics the mainstream won't touch and they'll find truth together. And, and it didn't work because they got caught in a tribalism themselves. They avoided certain conversations. They avoided certain people. Um, and it also created a reaction from the mainstream because they were already too big. It's like, what do you mean Joe Rogan's dark? What do you mean Sam Harris is dark? Of course they're not. Um, but the, the missed opportunity there was how, what does a bottom up protocol for having these kind of conversations look like and then what might be a set of principles like my idea was like could you have a set of principles that you sign up to voluntarily as a media channel or as an alternative channel but you then have a kind of safety in numbers of this is how we're doing it this is how we're checking our working this is how we've decided to have these conversations and everyone else who's signed up to this set of principles has signed up to the same things so if one of us gets something so sort of an interview taken down by YouTube, maybe everyone else in this network is like, right, we're going to upload that interview. Can they take us all down at once? I don't know. That That's, that's sort of, I know that a lot of other people are, are thinking about this conversation. It's like, what would a collective solution look like? What would safety and numbers look like that means that we couldn't be all picked off by the big tech platforms? Um, and for me, like that was one of the biggest issues with, that's why I did the Ivermectin film in the way that I did was like, I thought Brett was blurring the boundaries between discussion of topics and partisanship. And I wanted to deliberately pull that apart with the Ivermectin film. I was like, I don't think YouTube are banning people talking about Ivermectin. I think YouTube are banning people who are advising people to take Ivermectin in lieu of vaccines and are giving medical advice on their on their show, I think that's what's going on. I don't think it's the discussion. So I hosted the conversation with both sides. YouTube still took it down, but I think that was a, I think that was an algorithm thing. And I think they put it back up when they reviewed it. And I said, look, this is what I've done. This is what, um, but the truth is that YouTube were within their rights to take it down. When I actually looked at the YouTube rules after they took it down, it says, that there's no there's no exception in the YouTube rules for talking about something in a journalistic way. They said if anyone makes claims about ivermectin on your show, you can be taken down. And it's like, well, Tess Laurie made those claims for sure. The fact that I challenged her on those claims and I also had someone making the counterpoint doesn't matter. Like YouTube were within their rights to take it down, and they I don't know why they took it down. I don't know why they put it up. Like, how do we do like? That's unworkable. I suspect the reason they put it up is I was able to email them and say, I'm a journalist. I've been a journalist for 20 years. No one else is able to do that. Or not, some people are, but very few people have that kind of ability to say, look, I've followed Ofcom guidelines. I've done, I've done a journalistic job here. So we're all exposed to whatever the tech platforms want to do. So we have to, I think, I think we have to form some kind of a, collective process and yeah i'd like to be involved in that i mean another, another comment that people criticize like are you you want to be the art final arbiter of of sense making you want to be the final arbiter of of the alternative media or whatever it's like i i, I don't i'd love to be involved in that in that conversation i think i think i've been wrestling with these topics constantly for about three years and feeling them viscerally going from kind of mainstream or legacy media to alternative media and feeling like, oh, you get pulled in all sorts of directions by a comments thread, by the audience, by 
like this is really hard. And then you've got these alliances with people where it kind of affects your judgment. You don't want to interview certain people because you know that's going to piss off other people and there's certain areas. And then it becomes really tribal and like all of these topics come in. That's why it's so hard to make sense in the alternative media landscape. And I know, yeah, so so I I think... I think what this has proved and should prove if we avoid fixating on the characters and we avoid fixating on this kind of nonsense which is going on elsewhere, which is like Brett's got blood on his hands and Brett's responsible for this and like just scapegoating him. We take it away from that and try and look at what is this showing up in, in terms of the media landscape. That's where I think this conversation needs to go next and where we want to take it next. Does that, does that help, Gurgly? Uh, yes, yes, it does. Uh, I quite like the idea of like it being like some kind of self, like set of principles that you voluntarily subscribe to. It seems like it has the principle of like it being a thing that can grow because it seems like this sort of thing needs to be not an imposed solution, but a grown one. Yeah, yeah just I think it'd be good if people signed up to it across the political spectrum because there was a kind of ideological alignment with the original kind of IDW thing. So can you have a set of principles that everyone signs up to? And that there's incredibly difficult topics like what is what is bad faith and what is good faith is the most crucial topic now for for moving forward in this sense making landscape. Like that question is not resolved, and everyone is just accusing everyone else of bad faith. Like we we need some kind of protocol or some way of adjudicating that because otherwise it means people just avoid talking to each other and kind of project everything onto everyone else, like, oh, you're being the bad person. Yeah, Ali, you were going to say something. Yeah, I mean, this is something that's been been happening in the psychedelic space for the last year or 18 months. Um, people trying to create ethics guidelines for new companies coming into the space, trying to kind of uh, grab patents, et cetera. And I've been involved in that process. And, and, and the, it's it's really interesting. I think this is coming up in the decentral, in, in the process of decentralization, this inevitably comes up, which is how do you create a system of checks and balances? But then also the key thing is how do you make sure that that can't be weaponized and taken over? Because it will be within about four days of it coming up. Someone will weaponize it if they can. And and it, what's funny for me, and I think, Gurgly, your question was excellent. As I've been kind of thinking about it, I've been like, okay, well, you need to go through that system of checks and balances and you need to, and this is what the, happened with the Federalist Papers, with the, the kind of the forefathers of America and how the constitution was built, this process of going back and forth around checks and balances with in mind, which is the right thing to have in mind, how can this not be subject to tyranny? And although it's not perfect, it did pretty damn well. Um, and so I think something like that process has to happen, but key to it, and it doesn't work unless there are real significant consequences for bad actors. Otherwise the whole thing kind of falls apart. And what's also interesting for me is that the more you go into it, you just we just basically end up recreating our own society. We recreate civil society because, you know, gurgly when you ask, is it up to the individual podcast or is it up to the network of podcasts? I mean, I would say it's up to both, but a network of podcasts, both are institutions. That's what institutions are. This is something Daniel Schmachtenberger mentioned on um, uh, our most recent Sense Making 101 session. It's like, that's what an institution is for that you have that sort of exchange of ideas and a certain kind of um, containment uh, of, of the process. And then civil society is a whole bunch of institutions all communicating with each other. And so I think it's also really core that we don't, it took us thousands of years and, and millions of lives to get to that point. And we only got there quite recently in a lot of institutions. Like you could just lobotomize someone about 60 years ago if you felt, if you felt like it. I mean, it's quite new. Like where we're at right now is quite special and quite new. So I'm personally quite loath to throw out what we've learned and start from scratch in the media landscape because it took us a really long time to get there. It's almost like we're ditching it before we even had a chance to do it properly. So I, I think it's about, yeah, it's about robustness rather than reinvention, I think. Great. Um, I think, Grace, your question um, seems to have the most votes. 
I think everybody in this room has somebody in their life that's going off the rails or going off the rails. And everybody in this room is somebody that their friends think have gone off the rails. <laughs> okay. So where do you stop saying we need you to deal with this point, whether it's ivermectin or the vaccines or masks or whatever, where do we stop saying we need to get you to see straight and start saying, okay, we need to rebuild our relationship because I see that one of us or both of us are going off the rails and we need each other and stop talking about the issue and put it aside. I was married to somebody who was right wing and I think you all know that I'm not. And we, we just, you know, we didn't talk about that. We didn't talk about politics. It was fine. But, you know, when do you say we need to stop arguing about the thing and start building our friendship and our love together so that one or both of us doesn't separate? Is there a moment where you could see looking in retrospect at this set of conversations that that would be the moment? Yeah, it's a good question. And also. There's a there's a kind of hierarchy of importance of why in the same way that some sometimes friends are, are wrong about things or they do things that you kind of privately will say you sure about that that doesn't seem like a very sensible idea like like brett's unity 2020 idea i thought was kind of pretty kooky and kind of yeah kind of, it was it was bizarre as an idea um but it whatever it's like i don't feel the need to kind of harangue him over that i might kind of privately say hey are you sure about this like Tulsi Gabbard and Dan Crenshaw as non-political figures. He, you really think that's kind of a good solution? But it's like it's neither here nor there. But when you're into the area of like this particular topic, which is why Sam Harris was under such huge pressure to say something and put out the two podcasts about, about Brett, I think there is like lives are at stake. On whichever side, lives are at stake. If Brett's right, lives are at stake. If Brett's wrong, lives are at stake. There is an incentive, there's an ethical obligation to speak out and at least say, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. Maybe there is a better argument for the points that you're making. Maybe there are more credible figures making the making the points that you're making. So that that's the idea. Like criticizing the ideas and criticizing the points should be a sort of a sort of like, okay, maybe you can up your game. Maybe you can find more, more credible people. But yeah, I think there is a point where you let it go. And that for me is is after this. Like I think I I think I've said everything I've got to say. Other people can take up this fight. I don't feel the need to. I know a lot of people would sort of say, "Well, are you going to host this or are you going to host that?" And maybe if, if there's there's inquiries out at the moment to some of the kind of the main vaccine skeptical people and some doctors to potentially host a debate, which I've offered to do. Um, that may happen, but that's that's. It's it's taking the personal dimension out. It's taking the and, and I don't know. I hope I hope that at some point in the future we can come back together and heal the relationship. We've still got a lot of mutual friends. We've still got who are aware of what's going on, and I've kind of been in touch with as well. Names that you'll be familiar with, um, and so I think that obviously helps if it comes to kind of needing to rebuild the re rebuild the relationship afterwards. But it's a really good question, Grace. Yeah. I think uh, it's, it's good. I mean, the observation is that, you know, immediately you went back to the debate and not to the question, right? And not to the relationship. And also that we also, we, we tend to think like, yeah, but it's too important to stop discussing when we know we're never going to have an influence on that person as the relationship is deteriorating. So it's not an either or. Yeah. And, and I think, just bring it back down to earth. It's like, that's why this topic I think has got so much resonance for so many people, why it feels like that honestly, this last three weeks has been kind of felt like being plugged into the mains a little bit. I think because of the energies around this topic, the fact that everyone has feels like they have a, a dog in this fight. Everyone has had someone in their life or someone in their families, e either they're, they're the ones who are skeptical and they've had other people putting pressure on them to kind of, do something that they feel is against their will or the other way around they've they've got people in their lives that they feel are putting others at at risk like these are these are hugely difficult topics and it's yeah i as i said at the beginning i'm glad that we had that conversation the other week where 
everyone could express themselves and people felt that they were able to talk about their attitudes without without feeling judged. And I hope that we can create that space around these topics, even if it's really difficult to find that kind of space out there in the world. And this was a question that came up last week in our sense-making course, when a participant asked, how do you make sure that you don't go off track? What we've tried to do since the beginning is have those honest conversations as clearly as we can and develop those relationships of real honest reflection, what Peter Limburg calls friendships of virtue, where you you have enough people around you that you trust to tell you when you're going off track, that you know will give you those, will will tell you that. And I have that, for example, with Peter, Ali and I have that, that process with each other where we know that if we don't confront dynamics in the relationship or in the company and in then they will show up like all of these you you're just cruising for a you're cruising for a fall if you ignore things that you know actually need to be addressed and obviously those things are magnified under the under the under the pressure of of success and attention and all of those things so um and that's i felt that really intensely over the last few weeks because i have felt that level of attention i know that other people have been looking at what Brett's been up to for quite a long time and have been deeply concerned about it. So I know we've got eyes on us and I felt that extra level of jeopardy and it's brought a new level of kind of consciousness of trying to be as ethically scrupulous as I can be while also feeling like even that process, like, God, how fucking sanctimonious is that guy? Like even that starts becoming... Like, look at who the fuck does that guy think he is? Like, talking about ethics all the fucking time. What a prick. Um, so, I mean, what can you do about that? You're in, a, you're in a bind. Like, either you kind of, you do the kind of ethical game as best you can and try and talk about how you're doing it, but then you come across like an like a absolute arsehole. So you're caught one way or another, but that's the only way, yeah, that's the only way I know how to act. So... That's how we're trying to do it. Um, but we'll all fail. We'll all do things. We'll all fail in some ways. But I, but I hope I've, I hope that I and we have built up the relationships over the time we've been doing it that, that will keep us accountable. And I, I feel like the success we've had so far is because of that alignment that we've, that we've managed to achieve in as much as we've managed to achieve it so far. Right. So question from... So yeah, questions come in. So um, is the paradigm of giving equal voice or platform to both sides of the argument or discussion past its use by date when there are so many detailed nuances and facts that provide a tiny puzzle piece and a hugely complex picture, as well as the apparent dissolution of our left-right political field? How can the discussion platform be moved beyond pro and anti? Yeah, this is a really... Great question. And the other thing that this topic, I think, has demonstrated for me and hopefully for everyone is just how infinitely complex even the smallest topic is, like even the topic of the effectiveness of ivermectin. Like it's an incredibly complex conversation. The vaccines, they're incredibly complex. They are massive, massive um, things, things to look at. And so I think it's true that but the idea of both sides, I think, is is now obviously not the case. And I think this also points back to that some kind of solution has to be. So before this, this actually all kicked off, I was talking to Peter Lindbergh and a few other people about how what would it be to kind of create sense-making squads around these topics? Like you could have kind of an informal sense-making squad where you got together and you'd kind of you had people from with sort of relevant backgrounds in the different areas. And I guess a lot of the people we know are already involved in those informally. Um, a lot of them are kind of in touch with each other quite a lot behind the scenes. And I know during the pandemic, um, the likes of Jamie and Daniel and Jordan and Tristan Harris and people like that were in groups together, kind of doing a lot of kind of sense making and trying to respond to, to, to things that were needed, like very practical things like masks and medics and all of that sort of stuff. Um, 
but I think some kind of yeah the debates don't work sort of pro and anti debate so I think I think some kind of modeling of a more nuanced inquiry needs to come about um I guess th there was a hint that we were getting towards something like that with like the initial kind of rush of interest in clubhouse felt like oh wow there's 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 a there's potential here that I don't think has been lived up to for various reasons um but certainly long form conversations can 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 help us get there i think yeah there's this lovely quote i can't remember who said it but it's um a question you answer a paradox you live with um and this is something i often feel that there's a like the a debate or like um you know the question is pointing to the kind of like yes no left right let's get to the the truth of it through this kind of um kind of binary inquiry which i think does have some value in, in some cases it doesn't what it doesn't account for is complexity because as nora bateson actually points out like the environment is changing as you're trying to make sense of it. So as soon as you've come into a position, the, the environment's already changed. So you've wasted your time and that's the world we live in. And so I think the there's a kind of cultural shift and culture is upstream from all of this stuff. Like you can make sense until the cows come home, but it doesn't matter if, if you don't have the cultural container. This is something I've been really focused on recently. Like that is upstream. That's the place to focus on. It's. It, I, I have this phrase that keeps coming to me, which is "stop making sense, start making culture," because it's like that's that's the point which actually informs how you make sense. Um, and that, for me, like that that process of moving from yes, no, left, right to an ongoing process of yeah, that process, but then the flexibility of it changing constantly. Um, and imagine, you know, if governments worked like that, it would look very different. You know, and and so I think that's that's a, a really interesting paradigm and cultural shift is, is moving from the binary uh, towards something that includes the binary, but also includes the the constantly changing nature of of absolutely everything. So, I'd like to take two more questions um, from one from Namali and one from. From Ken, although Ken, you're going to have to cut your question down massively because it's way too long. Um, but I, I think it's interesting. It talks about sanctimony, and it's something I'm very concerned about um, being too sanctimonious. Um, but Ali, you need to to leave pretty soon. Did you want to? Yeah, yeah. I'm I've, uh, probably stay around for for one question. I've taken over the living room, so um, I'm I'm going to uh, be be a good husband and not take it over for the rest of the evening. But yeah, just just to um, talk a little bit about you know some of the stuff we've been we've been thinking of and putting our money where our mouth is and actually creating spaces where we can make sense like this together. And you know one of those things is we're we're hoping to do a another free large online event at the end of September, similar to what we've done for so sim uh, before rather so similar to something like the Rebel Wisdom Festival potentially with a hybrid element um that's that's a logistical um uh logistical challenge and exciting one that we're, we're trying to crack but hopefully we can have covid permitting in-person uh meetups along with an online experience so but we we really want to as we always have create stitch create spaces create containers where we can actually start all together experimenting with and and practicing what what does it look like to make sense in a completely different way incorporating all the many things that we're all interested in all the many things we talk about on the channel so um yeah i think that's for me a, an exciting uh prospect awesome so i'm gonna quickly answer ken's question and finish with namali's question because i think it's a good a good end point um Ken, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful because I think your exploration is, I mean, there's, 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 there's big questions of maturity around this in both personal and in the in the debate. And um, and you going into that space has revealed a lot to me. Uh, and so, so so my question, I was I was very struck by the first film going, it seemed to be epistemologically open, 
going 80% and then saying it's, well, 90% and then saying it's the last 10%. It was very compelling, even though I'm leaning more to ivermectin. Whereas the second interview with, is it Oreo's editor? Um, had a, had yeah, a heavier, I know. Yeah, it had a heavier, what, what I'm now calling a sanctimonious um, bias to it. You were being open about your, your sanctimonious biases and your judgments, and it was much less effective. Um, and then, and then, so beyond that, so there's a question around effectiveness and engagement. Did you find that sanctimony coming from both myself and Iona in that film? Oh yeah, yeah. It was just, I just noticed it was much less effective as well. And the first one was brilliant. The first one was brilliant. The first video was brilliant, and it didn't go there. So maybe, yeah. maybe being aware of that, but also the personal development for everyone. I think our whole society needs to recognise that we don't to admit that we don't know. And, yeah. and the world is complex and unpredictable. And then we might yeah. humbly move forward to bring bubbles together. Yeah, and, no, it's yeah. a good, it's it's a good reflection. Um that maybe when you're in a dialogue with someone where you both agree, uh, some of that kind of tone comes in. Cause I, I mean, I did spend a long time obviously crafting the message in the first one and trying to do it as as deliberately as possible for a specific audience who I thought might be resistant to it. So it was it took quite a while to to do my my concern of it was yeah like i i wasn't sure how well that kind of style of talking direct to camera like i mean it kind of went across which is something that i i don't i haven't done that much of and i'm probably going to end up doing more of it now i think because this is sort of i think it's getting onto the topic where i feel like i've got something to contribute because this is what i've been obsessing over for the last three years i think the direction of rebel wisdom from from now is going to really delve into like how do we how do we start dealing with all of these different aspects of the sense making crisis and who can we find who can who can kind of give us some of the picture we had a we're about to put up a film tomorrow of our talks at the wilderness festival which was an amazing an event uh, that we did last weekend and we had a conversation with Alex Krasadomsky about sense making and his he had a really good point um, where he said it's more about how do you create healthy communities of dialogue rather than censorship everyone talks about free speech and censorship but it's like how can you create and he said he made a really good point he said okay who here has a Facebook account and everyone put their hand up and he says who here is proud to have a Facebook account and everyone put their hands down it's like well that's that's the problem how do you create communities where people are proud to be part of because they then become self, you don't need to censor people in, the, in those. Like there, there's good norms of behavior, there's positive role models, there's healthy communities, there's healthy dialogues. How do we create more of those? So that's kind of the that's a big part of it, I think, of how do we how do we begin to create healthy norms and and, and case studies for others to take note of. So that's where I think, yeah, that, that's where I think our attention is going to go from here so thank you ken we'll go to one last question from namali hello david uh, hey yeah i mean basically some of what i was writing about in my question um, has been somewhat addressed already in some ways basically i am realizing like many of us are i think is mainstream and alternative. I'm not talking so much specifically about vaccines or any of that, but a little bit more of a meta, how do we go about this whole uh, question? I think the greater purpose of uh, both alternative and mainstream is probably that we're trying to sense make if in our own different ways. And the fear that both sides have is probably the meaning crisis. So in between, um, if alternative nor mainstream are going away, I think we have to come, the, the trap that we've all fallen into is whether is it mainstream or alternative. And instead, I think we have to arrive at a place that it is, it has absolutely got to be alternative and mainstream. And if we overfocus on, there are upsides to both. If we overfocus on one of them to the neglect of the other, that's when we start to see what we're in right now. 
So I was really interested in hearing about that from you and you especially because I've heard you many times where I consider you coming a little bit more from the alternative, but you often offer almost as a legitimacy um, your experience at the BBC. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a weird paradox that when I, even now when I, introduce myself or I ask for interviews with with people I tend to bring up my background with the BBC and Channel 4 before I mention Rebel Wisdom um, and this is after sort of three years doing this um, my point so the, the point that I made about the uncanny valley like between the mainstream and the alternative when I spoke to to Alex Krasdomsky who was at, who was at Wilderness I sent him that article and he said yeah kind of but actually if you look at like the alternative has been deliberately stealing the mainstream's clothes for a very long time. If you watch InfoWars, for example, it's it's done up like CNN and has been for for years. Like the the distinction between the two has been has been very shaky for quite a long time. And obviously the the impact of the alternative on the mainstream has made the mainstream a lot more like the alternative. They've ended up being caught by a lot of the same traps of declining audience, increased polarization, increased going for, like if, if the New York Times goes for a subscription model, which it does, then there are certain topics that it probably won't touch because it's quite easy. Like you, you do an article that they don't like about a really hot topic, say, trans being a kind of obvious one that that is really big lots of people will unsubscribe like a lot of something that really hits people and they don't like on any particular topic people will start unsubscribing in the same way that the alternative gets caught by these kind of audience capture and patreon subscriptions and all of these things that warp our thinking those same things are warping the mainstream um so yeah i think the distinction the distinction is no longer as clear as it was there's there's a kind of degree of institutional inertia in the mainstream of people who are still trying to do things a certain way because that's how they were taught but a lot of that's being lost as well like there's a new as, as we covered in the in the summer about the um sense making series there's a new breed of activist journalists who believe that activism is more important than the truth and that that really came through in the Black Lives Matter protests and Barry Weiss being forced to leave the New York Times and all of these kind of questions about. So, so there's, we have hollowed out institutions on one side and nascent, incomplete institutions on the other. And it's, it's probably increasingly hard to tell the difference between the two. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm lucky enough to... I know, I know a lot of people on YouTube will kind of sneer at kind of BBC and Channel 4 as, as kind of, oh, yeah, you're obviously kind of caught by the corporate mainstream or whatever. It's like, well, BBC is not corporate. Like the, I think our, our landscape in the UK is much healthier than it is in, in the US. The US is entirely corporate. It's been corporate forever. Like there is, there is no public media with, with a kind of duty to inform. And you can argue like how how bad the BBC has got. And I, I will agree with a lot of the, I will agree with a lot of the criticisms of it, but it had, it had a lot of institutional force for an awful long time. Like it was, it was an incredible invention, a kind of hands length from government, holding government to account, doing incredibly well. Channel four, the department I used to work for won the international Emmy, like three years out of four, um, while I was there, it's like it's considered one of the, the best TV news stations in the world. And the BBC, I think, still has that institutional backing. And, and that I don't think the US has. Like, I think we actually have a healthier culture of truth seeking in the UK compared to the US. Um, and that's maybe, maybe where, yeah, I, we'll see. I, I think, I think. I think the distinction is no longer really as clear as it was. Um, does that answer your question, Namali? Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it it's uh, just a sort of a. I mean, I I really appreciate what you're doing, and I think my I guess my invitation is just um, 
we're we're in a world of sort of more polarities rather than sort of getting stuck in the trap of uh, feeling like we have a problem to solve. I think we do have problems to solve, but I think we miss that there are polarities. And whatever is in a polarity, just like masculine and feminine or work and play or inhale and exhale, we cannot do just one thing. We cannot just do alternative. We cannot just do mainstream. And then to remember that, you know, each of those things that we might put in a poll, they are in different stages. There's there's postmodern both. There is pre-modern both. And there's post-progressive both as well. Mm. So it's just sort of freeing and... I guess I guess I'll just hope that maybe you can find some comfort in that as well. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And yeah, I feel like this whole process of, has given me a lot more editorial confidence in a way that I didn't maybe have before. Especially kind of being yeah, going through that fire of like because I do feel like we've had a, a some kind of a a legacy audience, especially on YouTube as well, from like the Jordan Peterson films and the IDW content and like deliberately kind of steering into that feels like I'm much more interested to look at those questions of what does a synthesis look like? Um, and I think I've got more confidence to steer into that after this process, which which is, yeah, kind of a, a, a relief um, as well. Um, yeah, so we've, we're at two hours, so... Thank you for everyone who stayed for all the extra time, the really great questions. And the, like I said, the support over the last few weeks has really been invaluable to kind of make sense of this together. Coming up, we're going to have the campfire gathering next Monday. Thank you. And please do, as we traditionally do, unmute yourself and say goodbye and see you soon. Hey. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. The film you just watched was a conversation that happened in Rebel Wisdom's digital campfire. So to join conversations like this, to submit questions, stay for the after hours hangout to talk about the ideas in the films, and to practice and develop some of the skills we talk about on the channel, check out the membership options. There's three different levels of membership. Sense makers get to join our regular SenseMaker showcase events with some of the most interesting thinkers around. And also the monthly Wisdom Gym sessions where we speak to and also have a chance to work with some of the world's best teachers and facilitators. Explorers can join the Rebel Wisdom Book Club sessions, the monthly Philosophical Journey sessions, and also the regular Skills Academy to practice skills like mindfulness, sovereignty, and sense making. And from now on, all members get to join our monthly AMA sessions with us, where you can ask any questions about anything to do with Rebel Wisdom. 